Well, I told you yesterday that as Kamala Harris was speaking, laying out some of her economic proposals, speaking about the horrible shooting that took place at a school in Georgia, Donald Trump was wildly posting to Truth Social. And I told you we would look at it today. I want to do that now. I can't even put into words the degree to which Trump is whiny and triggered in every single one of these videos. Trump, who has done essentially nothing but complaining about how everyone has treated him so unfairly and he's so great and everyone's so bad and she's a communist and he's a Marxist and it's going to be 1929 all over again. Trump is now saying that it's Kamala Harris that's constantly complaining. Take a listen to this. Comrade Kamala Harris does nothing but complain, always complaining about this or that. But she's in the administration now. Why doesn't she do something? She does nothing but talk, nothing but gripe, nothing but complain about the terrible border or the economy and inflation. But she's been there for three and a half years. So why doesn't she fix it? Now, of course, vice presidents famously don't make policy and it's completely legitimate for Kamala Harris to be pointing out, hey, there's a gap. Here's where we are. Here's where I would want us to be. Here's how I propose closing that gap. There's nothing wrong with that. But the real irony is the whiniest man on the planet, Donald Trump, saying that it's Kamala Harris that's whining and complaining all the time. Now, it doesn't just stop here. Trump decided in these just video after video after video, mass furiously posting, recording, tweeting, trothing. Um, Trump saying, despite the booming stock market that we've seen under the Biden administration, that if Kamala Harris becomes president, there will be a massive stock market crash, which you might remember is the same prediction he made before Joe Biden became president. Trump cash versus Kamala crash. Kamala. We're going to have a crash like 1929. If she gets in, it will not be pretty. Trump stood around screaming at a camera for a dozen videos. And this is the best that he can do. The 1929 crash I predicted four years ago that never happened. Well, this time I'm going to be right now. Goldman Sachs is saying very much the opposite. And we talked about this on the bonus show a couple of days ago. Whether you like Goldman Sachs or you don't like Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs has an interest in evaluating what are the economic indicators that we believe are important and making predictions for their customers. They make money by being right about this stuff. And it doesn't take a genius. You don't need a team of 100 economists to figure out that in general, stock market performance is better under Democratic presidents, unemployment is lower. Job creation is higher. GDP growth is greater. Inflation is lower. I could go on under Democratic presidents and very much contrary to what Donald Trump is saying. Goldman Sachs is saying, actually, we think we would be better off with a Harris presidency than with a Trump presidency as far as the economy goes. Remember that Trump's been issuing the same statement. We will see a crash the likes of which we haven't seen since 1929. Trump made that statement in 2020. He made it in 2021. He made it in 2022. He made it in 2023. And so far, he's always been wrong. Now, I do think it's important to mention that there are certain predictions you can just make every year and you'll probably eventually be right. And what I mean by that is unless something at a structural level changes about how our economy works, we have booms and busts. We have ups and downs. There are people who have been predicting a recession for 10, 10 years, 10, 11 years. They've been wrong so far, uh, but at a certain point they could be right. The question is, does that really make their predictions valuable? Because if you had followed them since 2014, you would have missed out on some of the greatest stock market growth in a really long time in the United States. So the fact that you make the same prediction every year and you might eventually be right still doesn't mean that you're someone that we should be listening to. So a bunch of these videos as Trump was wildly triggered, triggered while uh, Kamala Harris was speaking. I want to talk a little bit about Tim Walls and then I'll tell you a little more of what Trump's been up to. Tim Walls is really, really good at doing politics. 
You might recall that J.D. Vance recently had a horrible uh, experience attempting to order donuts at a donut shop and pretending that he's a normal person. Well, Governor Tim Walls, he, he's just he's so fun. He's so good at this. Tim Walls went to a donut shop as well. And he actually mentions just as an aside, look at me. I have no problem picking out donuts, a direct shot across the bow at J.D. Vance. And then maybe peanut the peanut butter original. There's uh, a big popularity. We're a big fan of pumpkin. We're pumpkin, pumpkin. Yeah, big we're fan pumpkin of pumpkin. people. All right. All right. I think that's what we're going to do. I think Absolutely. get th that one and that one, maybe. All right. All right. Peaches are really good here, too. Peaches, too. That's what I said. Yes. The peaches? I could balance it out to have a nutritional diet. I said, look at me. I have no problem picking out donuts and things. So <laughs> it's 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 just so subtle. It's so subtle, but so obvious what he's pointing to. And it's the fact that J.D. Vance, he can't even pick out donuts in a normal way. Let me remind you, this was a couple of weeks ago. J.D. Vance having an interaction with some donut shop workers in Georgia, one of whom was very unimpressed that he's running for vice president. Another who just didn't even want anything to do with J.D. Vance. Uh, the zoo has come to town. Thank you for letting us come in here. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, man. Okay. She, 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 she doesn't want to be on film, guys, so just cut her out of anything. I appreciate that, man. Um, I'm Katie Vance. I'm working for Vice President. Good to see you. Okay. Um, How old are you working? I've been here since uh, the beginning of July. Okay. But this year? Okay, good. How about you, sir? Uh, uh, almost two years. Just dripping in charisma. Good. Just everything. Yeah, it'll be a lot of glaze, tears, some sprinkle stuff, some of these cinnamon rolls. Just Whatever makes sense. <laughs> I would like whatever makes sense. How long has this establishment been functioning? Were the walls made of ply? <laughs> it, it, it's just it's painful. It's painful. How long have these light bulbs been here? Have you completed the transition to LED bulbs and Tim Walls continuing to be very personable? This is not why we vote for people. We vote for people because we look at the policy and we look at the vision and we look at the respect for the rule of law and institutions. But when they also just happen to be kind of nice, normal people that relate to others in a way that we consider to be, you know, what we would expect of others, uh, it certainly helps to make the case that we're making the right decision in how we vote. Tim Walls is really, really good at doing politics. You might recall that J.D. Vance recently had a horrible uh, experience attempting to order donuts at a donut shop and pretending that he's a normal person. Well, Governor Tim Walls, he, he's just he's so fun. He's so good at this. Tim Walls went to a donut shop as well. And he actually mentions just as an aside, look at me. I have no problem picking out donuts, a direct shot across the bow. At JD Vance. And then maybe the peanut butter original. There's uh, a big popularity. We're a big fan of pumpkin. We're pumpkin. Family. pumpkin. Yeah, big we're fan pumpkin. pumpkin people. All right. All right. I think that's what we're gonna do. I think Absolutely. get th that one and that one maybe. All right. Mm -hmm. Peaches are really good here, too. Peaches too. That's what I said. Yes. The peaches. I could balance it out to have a nutritional diet. <laughs> I said, look at me. I have no problem picking out donuts and things. So <laughs> it's 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 just so subtle. It's so subtle, but so obvious what he's pointing to. And it's the fact that J.D. Vance, he can't even pick out donuts in a normal way. Let me remind you, this was a couple of weeks ago. J.D. Vance having an interaction with some donut shop workers in Georgia, one of whom was very unimpressed that he's running for vice president. Another who just didn't even want anything to do with J.D. Vance. Uh, the zoo has come to town. Thank you for letting us come in here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Okay. Yeah. She, 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 she doesn't want to be on film, guys, so just cut her out of anything. I appreciate that, man. Um, I'm Katie Vance. I'm running for vice president. Good to see you. Okay. How um, old are you working? I've been here since uh, the beginning of July. Okay. But this year. Okay, good. How about you, sir? Uh, uh, almost two years. Okay. Just dripping in charisma. Good. Good. Just everything. Yeah, it'll be a lot of glaze, tears, some sprinkle stuff, some of these cinnamon rolls, just whatever makes sense. I'll just flip it around. <laughs> I would like whatever makes sense. How long has this establishment been functioning? Were the walls made of ply? <laughs> it, it, it's just, it's painful. It's painful. 
How long have these light bulbs been here? Have you completed the transition to LED bulbs? And Tim Walls continuing to be very personable. This is not why we vote for people. We vote for people because we look at the policy and we look at the vision and we look at the respect for the rule of law and institutions. But when they also just happen to be kind of nice, normal people that relate to others in a way that we consider to be, you know, what we would expect of others, uh, it certainly helps to make the case that we're making the right decision in how we vote. All right. Trump went completely berserk. Twenty two troth central posts in an hour, if you can believe it. Uh, headlines and reporters globally realizing this guy is suffering from a major malfunction as his campaign crumbles around him. His relationship with Melania continues to be non-existent. He seems to have made a farcical and disastrous choice to select J.D. Vance as his vice presidential running mate. And Kamala Harris is out there campaigning while he's sharing A.I. generated fake fan pictures. If you scroll through his truth social feed, you see video after video after video. Many of these attempting to talk about policy, but failing, like listen to this one about energy. I'm running on a plan to cut your energy prices in half within 12 months of taking office. Your energy prices are going to fall at levels that you've never seen before. It's ridiculous. This will never happen. Trump is not going to cut energy prices by 50 percent. And of course, he never mentions what type of energy. He never tells us how he's going to do it. Endless, endless, endless videos like this. Trump talking about mortgage rates. During my presidency, the 30 year mortgage rate reached an all time low of 2.7 percent. Under Kamala Harris, it's become nearly impossible for young people to buy a home with interest rates at almost 10 percent or even higher. Yes, interest rates are at about six and a quarter, historically low a short term high, but down from the peak. But I don't know, 10, 11, 12 percent. Sure, if he can get away with it, he'll get away with it. Then starting with the A.I. generated images of different kinds uh, as he posts more videos, uh, supposed gang members, um, various individuals, uh, sycophants and dilettantes, as he likes to say, video after video after video after video. Comrade Kamala Harris is doing everything possible to run away from her record. We won't let this happen. She will destroy our country just like she destroyed San Francisco. San Francisco, a famous, famous place. It is DOJ policy that the Department of Injustice should not take any action that will influence an election within 60 days of that election. But they have just taken such an action. Voting starts on September 6th. Therefore, the DOJ has violated its own policy just in going after me. Election interference, they call it. Yeah. Nobody believes this stuff unless you're already completely committed to Trump. And again, I'm scrolling. This is all back to back to back. Trump picking up on the story that Tim Wall's family is voting for Trump. Now, it might be the case that Tim Wall's family is voting for Trump or not. But these are like his third cousins. These are people you can legally they could legally marry in every state and there would be no genetic concerns with procreation. Like that's how distantly related to Tim Walls these people are. I don't really care one way or the other. They're just wrong in who they're supporting. But as if this is a story that's going to convince anyone and, you know, I, I'm just scrolling through and showing people uh, edits of Trump with the flag over him. Um, various posts. Kamala wants to raise your taxes, uh, images comparing uh, things like credit card delinquency rates and personal savings rates, completely out of context stuff. And then posting, of course, his interview with Lex Friedman. This is Trump's campaign. It's mostly posting to Truth Social. No events this week for Trump at all. And the only event on his calendar as of this moment is a rally in Wisconsin Saturday, tomorrow, Saturday in Mosini, Wisconsin. That is the, no events this week and one rally in Wisconsin tomorrow, which gets us back to a question that I asked last week. Does Trump even want to win or does he want to lose 
claim fraud to save face with his followers and ride off into the golfing sunset and not deal with this political stuff, which has really ruined his life and the life of many of the people he claims to lo love. Uh, if you're really honest about it, I don't know. He's certainly not acting like a guy who's trying to win. Make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the David Pakman show. We'll take a quick break and be right back. Don't forget that the best way to support the David Pakman show is by becoming a member, which gives you access to the daily bonus show, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire archive of every episode dating back a really long time and plenty of other awesome membership perks. Go to joinpacman.com. Joinpacman.com. The David Pakman show does depend on none other than your support to keep the show going. If you're hearing this message, you're not getting the full David Pakman show experience, which you could get. Sign up at joinpacman.com. You'll get instant access to all of our great member benefits, including the daily bonus show, an extra show that we produce every single day for our members, commercial free audio and video streams of the show made available hours before the show is published publicly and so many other great things, including the soundboard on the website where we have recently added Saudi Arabia and Russia will repeat your oh. exactly a sign up at joinpacman.com. Use the coupon code Save Democracy 24. In the latest blockbuster and yet completely obvious news, there is reporting from Mediaite that many elected Republican leaders secretly want Donald Trump to lose. And I have to tell you, they are completely correct in their assessment. I want to talk about this with you. The article reports. Several law and by the way, just riddled with ads of this website, several longstanding elected Republican lawmakers are secretly hoping that the party's nominee, Trump, is defeated. According to Politico's playbook, some within the Republican Party are keen to move on from Trump, even if they'd never admit it publicly. And according to the outlet, this is not just your usual never Trump crowd. Key individuals have relayed concerns and confidence including free marketeers who don't like Trump's tariffs, pro-life lawmakers who don't like Trump's pro-choice remarks and defense hawks worried about his stance on NATO. But maybe more importantly, there's a strategic aspect to this. Politico reporter Jonathan Martin wrote the best possible outcome in November for the future of the Republican Party is for Donald Trump to lose and lose soundly. Republican leaders won't tell you that on the record. I just did. The this is a completely correct assessment, as I've said before, and many people call in and they say what happens to the party, the Republican Party, if Trump wins versus if Trump loses. We don't know what's going to happen in November. Trump may eke out a win electorally. I, I just we just don't know yet. But we know that Trump has been very bad for the Republican Party since eking out a win in 2016. Republicans underperformed in the 2018 midterms, even relative to what was expected. Trump lost in 2020. The 2022 red wave failed to materialize and Republicans actually expanded uh, uh, Democrats rather expanded their control of the Senate uh, since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Thanks to Trump's three Supreme Court picks, we've seen loss after loss on va various ballot referenda uh, related to those issues. It's been disaster after disaster. The best way to get away from this MAGA Trumpism is for Trump to be soundly defeated in 2024. I know different people disagree as to whether he'll run again in 2028. I do not believe that he will. And then it will allow the Republican Party to go in a different direction. If Trump wins in 2024, this all gets extended. And then you have the real possibility of a MAGA type candidate in 2028, not Trump, but someone else. And it continues and it continues. If Trump loses, you get the opportunity to rebuild with a clear break from Trump's destruction of the party. Craft some new image, if you can, that will maybe be more appealing to voters. Reduce the internal conflict. The Republican Party, I mean, look, you've got uh, child, some of the children of the late Senator John McCain, a Republican, saying, I'm voting for Kamala Harris. 
You've got all sorts of different Republicans. You had Republican officials who even spoke at the DNC. There is massive internal chaos right now. Trump losing could reduce the Republican conflict and the debate over should we or shouldn't we go with Trump, move on and go to something more cohesive. It would allow them to reevaluate their electoral strategy if indeed Trump loses, where we have these situations now where uh, you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona are these lost cause states. Republicans now regularly win Ohio and Florida, but that doesn't seem to actually guarantee that they can uh, uh, win electorally. They need a rethink of the electoral strategy. And with Trump, you're just locked into what it is right now. That's another reason. Bring in new leadership, pave the way for new leadership with a Trump loss and get away from these pseudo Trump sycophants and the overt Trump sycophants. Just get away from all of them and maybe get back to running on policy rather than personality. Honestly, I don't know whether the Republican voters want that. What we do know is that the way they've been running on personality now for a while, the MAGA types in 2022, Trump in 2020, it's not really been great for them. They've lost and lost and lost and lost. Maybe get away from the personal controversies and the personalities and try to find a way to come up with some policies that are, will, will appeal to the broader electorate. Now, I'm not giving them advice. I hope they continue losing. What I'm telling you is that the instinct that the reporting says is there among the Republican leaders that Trump is bad for us and it would be better for him to lose. That very much, very much seems to be the case. Let me know what you think. Hey, here's something really funny. Uh, we know historically that the business environment is better when a Democrat is in the White House. Job growth is stronger when there's a Democrat in the White House. Unemployment is lower with a Democrat in the White House. GDP growth is higher. Stock market performance is better with a Democrat in the White House. We know all that. But it's really funny when you get a couple of right wingers together. In this case, it's Fox Business host Stuart Varney and Republican National Committee Chair Michael Watley. That's not Tim Watley, the dentist from Seinfeld. This is Michael Watley. And they agree that what Kamala Harris wants to do with this new small business startup cost deduction is a good idea. They're agreeing she has a good economic idea. Listen to this. I just want to press she's the point. going to walk back I, I, on I, all of that right now. I just want to press the point. When a political candidate comes up with what I think is a good idea, I have to call it a good idea. And a $50,000 tax cut for small, not tax cut, but a tax credit for startups or small businesses, coupled with less red tape. I got to say, that is a good idea, regardless of our other tax ideas. While that may be a good idea, it's hard to see how she's going to move forward with it. And she certainly is not going to reduce red tape. I <laughs> so Watley acknowledges it is a good idea. I doubt she'll do it, but it is a good idea. And I just don't know that I believe she's going to do it. This is an uncontroversially good idea. Make it easier for startup businesses to deduct initial expenses most of which are already deductible, but she wants to make to, to expand that when you lower. This is what Republicans claim to like when you lower financial barriers to entering and starting a new business. More individuals will start businesses when you reduce the cost of starting a business. The entrepreneur or the business owner can allocate capital more efficiently towards productive ventures rather than the constraint of those initial costs. Startups often require goods and services to get going. When you stimulate more new businesses, they then stimulate other local businesses by going to them for the products and services they need to start their business. Tax deductions lower the net real upfront financing requirements in order to get the business going. Another way in which you're reducing barriers to entry and not to mention, you know, we talk about the business environment and employment numbers being stronger when there's a Democratic president. When a startup is successful, it hires additional employees. The right loves to tell you if you just cut income taxes for the rich, it stimulates employment. We don't have evidence of that. For the most part, when you give a tax cut to people with a low marginal propensity to consume, meaning they don't really need any more money to fund their lives. 
they just save it. And while that money can be loaned out in the form of new loans, it is not nearly as economically stimulative as increasing uh, the uh, cash on hand or direct money available to those with a higher marginal propensity to consume. New businesses often need every single dollar that they have. And so that is a tax deduction that would have a very positive and stimulative effect. So listen, it's Stuart Varney saying it is a good idea. And it's Michael Watley saying it's a good idea, but I don't really believe that Kamala Harris is going to do it. When you actually look through a lot of Kamala Harris's proposals, it's not that Republicans should like them because they are, quote, conservative. I don't even think there's much conservative left about this Republican Party. They should like them because a lot of these proposals do the thing they claim to want to do with their tax cuts for the rich, which is improve the business environment, stimulate innovation and new businesses and actually generate a multiplier effect by creating business entities that then themselves will go and become customers of other small and medium sized businesses. So I'm glad they're admitting it. I don't know to what degree this sort of fine grained detail will make it onto the debate stage next week. I hope it does. And uh, I will be live streaming the debate. I hope you'll join me starting at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific on September 10th. That is uh, Tuesday for the uh, Harris Trump presidential debate, which I can only imagine is going to be absolutely fascinating. Let's take a very quick break and then we'll continue. If you value what we do at the David Pakman show, remember to support us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash David Pakman show where you can get access to behind the scenes videos, the daily bonus show, the commercial free daily show. You can support the show for as little as two dollars a month. Check it out at patreon.com slash David Pakman show. One of the great pleasures, little pleasures of the 2024 presidential campaign has been seeing Fox News do this dance where they like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and they don't like him and he's a lunatic or he's a savior or he's a genius or he's a degenerate. And it all depends on their latest calculation about whether or not RFK is helping Trump or hurting Donald Trump. This has gone back and forth a number of times. I have an endlessly hilarious clip to play for you here where a now terrified Fox News is straight up just comparing Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. This was anchor Griff Jenkins <laughs> saying that RFK's behavior is not normal. It's not normal. Cutting the head off of a whale, dumping a dead bear and staging it to look like a bicycle accident. This is this is pretty serious deviant behavior. Uh, but uh, in the political world, anything is acceptable until it's not. So let's listen. This is just, you know, if he was helping Trump, they would ignore all of this stuff the way they mostly ignored it all along. Take a listen. RFK Jr. has been named to Donald Trump's transition team, along with former Democrat Tulsi Gabbard. That's what happens when you endorse the candidate. But Kennedy, who's already admitted covering up, uh, putting a dead bear in his car, now faces a tale once told by his daughter Kick about how he used a chainsaw to cut off the head of a dead whale and strapped it to the roof of his car. Right. Every time we accelerated on the highway, whale juice would pour into the windows of the car. It was the rankest thing on the planet. We all had plastic bags over our heads with mouth holes. What is it with these people and putting animals on the roof of their cars? Remember when Mitt Romney strapped his dog to the roof of the car in a crate? Every time I don't say in a crate, I get one angry email. The dog was so terrified that it was diarrhea was flying. In this case, it's whale juice with RFK. Wild stuff. Out, And people on the highway were giving us the finger, but that was just normal day to day stuff for us. Griff Jenkins is back. Listen, um, I uh, almost don't know what to say about this. Uh, what is it with RFK and dead animals? Mitt Romney should ask for a recount after all the media mockery that he. Oh, no, I, and he's bringing it up God, for putting a dog, his dog on the roof. There his dog on the roof. At least the dog was still alive. Well, maybe now we finally know who put that horse head in the Godfather <laughs> bed in the Corleone saga, which should open a whole new can of worms. However, it's a different worm than the worm that was in RFK Jr.'s head, because remember, he had worms in his brain. Look, oh, you right. know, Kit Kennedy says that this was just normal stuff. Yeah. This is not normal. <laughs> you know who else collected roadkill? Jeffrey Dahmer. And this tale is not one of Clark 
Griswold and the family vacation truckster. I can see this the, is really bizarre. I stuff. can see the headline now that you're referring to Jeffrey Dahmer. And by uh, the way, if I can just point this out, this has resurfaced, as you pointed out, from this Town and Country article in 2012. But it prompted this week, the Washington Post reported that an environmental group is actually calling for an investigation to see if that incident violated some sort of Mammal Marine Protection Act. So right. So <laughs> listen. Griff Jenkins is right about one thing. None of this is normal. The way Fox has gone back and forth about we like RFK, we don't like RFK based on their latest calculation as to what he does to Donald Trump's chances. That's not normal. RFK's behavior. It's obviously not normal. Now, I don't know if it's fair to compare it to serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. RFK does seem to have somewhat of a fixation with animal corpses, but Jeffrey Dahmer seems like a bit much. But it's a reminder of how if you are at least giving the appearance that you're helping them, you can do no wrong. And if all of a sudden they start to think you're hurting them, you can't possibly do anything right. Now, as far as RFK and helping or hurting Trump is going, one of the funniest things that's going on is there was one period of time during the phase of his campaign where RFK was claiming he's in it to win it and in it to the end. He was involved in lawsuits to get his name on ballots. He now is involved in lawsuits to get his name off of ballots in states that are expected to be competitive. This was if you remember my coverage, I guess it was a week and a half ago or about a week ago, a uh, week and a half ago about how RFK has gotten out and he's endorsing Trump. He's suspending his campaign. He wants to stay on the ballot in states that won't be close so you can still vote for him. But in states where it will be close and it could hurt Trump, he wants to get his name off the ballot. There's a bunch of states, including uh, Michigan and maybe North Carolina, where now it's like too late to get himself off the ballot. And despite his endorsement of Trump, he will still be on the ballot in some of these critical states and hurting Donald Trump. I love all of it. I'll be totally upfront with you. I love every single bit of it. And I hope that he absolutely destroys Donald Trump's campaign at the end of the day. Donald Trump was in a video with apparently a member of one of his clubs, and it looks like one of those hostage videos. The guy that he's with um, says that Trump is likely to win New York and New Jersey, which, of course, he's not going to win New York and New Jersey. But I don't know about you. Trump standing awkwardly close to the guy and kind of hovering. And the guy makes this declaration that Trump he's hearing Trump's just going he could win Jersey and New York. Um, let's listen to it and pay close attention to whether the guy blinks the word torture in Morse code with his eyes. I'm going to win New Jersey. I believe it's uh, after I see what OJ and LT did at Wildwood. And from what I'm hearing, uh, being in the communities, I think he's going to take New Jersey and New York. I really believe that, you know. Everybody see what's going on. Like people ain't fooled no more. Yes. There you go. And a completely natural and not forced statement from this gentleman who is, I guess, a member at Trump's golf club and wants to be playing golf there. Now, hilariously, the New York Post tried this back in uh, June. This was at the end of June. They put out an editorial by a guy named Carl Campanile, which the, the title is so brilliant. It's brilliant in its absurdity. The title of this article was Trump may be first Republican to win New, Jer New York and New Jersey in decades after Biden debate debacle. Republican leaders say Republican leaders say is doing some serious, serious heavy lifting here. Now, I thought it might be useful just to look at the numbers. New Jersey is so obviously not competitive that we don't even have polling. Since Kamala Harris became the nominee, the only polling out of Jersey that is uh, rigorous enough for real clear politics is um, from March. And it has Biden plus seven. And importantly, Biden won by 20 in Jersey in 2020 and Hillary won by 13 in 2016 in New Jersey. And then in New York. We do have one poll again. These states are so not competitive that you, you often don't even have polling in New York. We have a poll that is from the Harris is the nominee phase where Donald Trump is polling thirty nine and Kamala Harris is polling fifty three. So Harris plus 14 in New York. Now, you might wonder 
Why do these people say this? Forget about whether the guy is being held hostage by Trump. How could anyone believe that Donald Trump is going to win New York or New Jersey? So then the question becomes, do they even believe it or is it just something they say to show that they are kind of part of the cult? And, and I believe it's actually the latter. There are definitely some Trumpists. We see them at rallies and you know, you hear from them. So there are some of these people who do literally believe the things that they are saying. But with a lot of them, you're sort of showing that you're on the team. The lies you tell are part of the war. Yes, they may be about a battle you're going to lose, but the way you win the war is by being on board and on message with regard to the talking points. And so with a lot of these folks, you know, I, I do think if you sit them down and you go, listen, you willing to bet that Trump wins New York? You willing to put some money behind the claim that Trump's going to win New Jersey? I think a lot of them know that Trump is not going to win either of those states. But this is how cults work. You repeat the stuff and to a degree they become your real beliefs because you are repeating them and being rewarded for repeating them. The, the guy who is in the video here, he's getting rewarded because Trump's filming a video with him. And it's a former president. And even if he's a doofus, you get something out of that. So I think there are swaths of Trump supporters that know that these are lies and there are swaths of Trump supporters that have fallen for them. But all of it links back to this is a cult and that's what we're dealing with here. Let me know your thoughts. Make sure that you've uh, checked out where we stand on the book pre-orders, my forthcoming book, The Echo Machine, available for pre-order absolutely everywhere that books, ebooks and audio books are sold. Let's take a quick break, then we'll get to Friday feedback. Follow us on social media, interact with the David Pakman Show community, see exclusive content, see when we're taking calls live and stay up to date on other big show announcements. We post daily. Find us on Reddit, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord and TikTok. It is that time of the week, much loved by some, much despised by others. It's time for Friday feedback when I take a look at just a small sampling of the messages we receive across various platforms. Some are praise, some are attacks, some are critiques, some are questions. But what I can assure you is that we can never fully represent the total scope of vile and disgusting anti-Semitic, homophobic, xenophobic and racist messages <laughs> that we receive all the time. But let's start somewhere and see if we can find some substance in the midst of all of it. Alexander Kappelhoff says just a short while ago, Pacman was arguing to keep Biden in the race. That makes me question his political insights now. Well, listen, First and foremost, we are all out here just giving our opinions as we see them. And when it comes to predictions or whatever, you get some right, you get some wrong, you move on, you analyze, you learn, you iterate. There's nothing special there. However, I think it's really important to just restate what I know most of my audience knows and remembers about the entire should Biden stay in or get out thing. At no point was I arguing to keep Biden in the race. There was a point 10 months ago where every poll, the fundraising numbers, the mood of the Democratic Party, everything pointed to right now the risks to kicking Biden out as he is winning primaries seem greater than Biden staying in given the incumbency uh, bias and, and advantage and the totality of the situation. As circumstances changed, I always gave you my best assessment and my thinking at the time. I was never, quote, arguing to keep Biden in. But there came a point and it was before many of you were ready to acknowledge it. There were some in my audience who said, David, you, you, you've got to say it's time for Biden to go. There were others who when I said, hey, you know what? At this point, the risk of Biden going no longer seems bigger than the risk of Biden staying. The debate performance was not good. Fundraising numbers are drying up. Major donors are saying we're not giving any more money. At a certain point, 
I gave you what I give you every time, which is my best, honest and frank assessment with all the information I have. And that assessment became in the aftermath of the debate now several months ago. Uh, it doesn't actually seem like Biden can win. It seems Biden's realizing he can't win. It seems donors are realizing Biden can't win. So by all means, there are infinite reasons to stop watching this show or listening to the show. But don't make them imaginary things like I was arguing to keep Biden. I was giving you my best assessment of the facts on the ground at the time. All right. Less substantively from TikTok, you look like Jake Gyllenhaal. You know, I've heard that before. I will gladly accept that. I have I have no issue with that whatsoever. All right. I mean, that seem doesn't seem like the worst thing in the world to look like Jake Gyllenhaal. And then also from TikTok, very different. You're a joke. It's the wrong you're. They mean you are, but they put why oh you are like my a joke. And also they said, don't believe any shit view, say gay fur. Gay fur. I assume this is homophobic, but the spelling and grammar is so atrocious. It's so heinous that I struggle to really figure out the particular <laughs> textures of the uh, of the homophobia. Uh, OK, rogue femme says about Donald Trump's recent comments regarding the only way Democrats can win is if they cheat. Rogue femme says pure narcissistic mindset. If I'm winning, it's fair. If I'm losing, then it's rigged against me. Yes, this is egomaniacal narcissism, pathological narcissism. It can only be a fair election if the outcome is that I've won. Any other outcome definitionally means it must have been stolen. I must have been cheated. It can't ever just be that I lost, that the people didn't want me. Uh, that actually is extraordinarily dangerous. Now, I know that we've gone back and forth over the last few years many times. Does Trump quote know that he lost or not? Sometimes it'll slip out. You know, next time we'll win. This is why they beat us. They beat us, but it was because they tricked or whatever. Trump has sometimes kind of let the facade slip. And so where I land on it at this point is Trump realizes he lost, but believes it was due to some kind of subterfuge or trickery or whatever the case may be. That that's kind of where I land at this point in time. Trist Kiss made a very interesting comment on YouTube, and the comment is as follows. Even though I was leaning towards Josh Shapiro for VP, I do think Kamala made the best choice in selecting Tim Walz. He will definitely be a happy warrior for her. He came up with the weird line that clearly got under Trump's skin after all. And I laughed out loud with how he responded in an interview with Jake Tapper about Republican criticism of his implementing free school lunches. His response was, wow, what a monster I am for making sure kids don't have empty bellies during school. Brilliant. Wall seems to be the perfect combination of progressive ideals wrapped up in an older folksy white dude who will appeal to liberals and moderates alike. Kamala knows what she's doing. She's going to make a great president and walls will be a fantastic vice president too. you know, let's not put the cart before the horse before you can be a fantastic president. You have to become president. Let's make sure we're focusing on that step first. Uh, but I generally agree very, very much with what this individual is saying. I uh, thought Mark Kelly was a great choice as far as his political acumen, intelligence and positions but that the public side of him is less good in that weird debate against that strange dude, Blake Masters. Uh, Mark Kelly was right on every issue, but he was not a particularly good debater. And I don't know that he was a particularly good or is a particularly good rhetorician. Josh Shapiro, an excellent choice. I would vote for Josh Shapiro for president today. However, however, I don't know that it's smart to complicate your possible path to victory with anti-Semitism because Josh Shapiro is Jewish. There is anti-Semitism on the left and on the right. I don't know. And I say this as a Jewish person. I don't know 
to what extent anti-Semitism, latent, overt, implicit, explicit, could have hurt a Harris Shapiro ticket. Would vote for him today. Would worry about that. When you take the the kind of sum of all these parts, uh, Tim Walls, a fantastic pick, strikes the right tone, uh, has credentials that the right often likes to deny to Democrats, military service, gun guy from the Midwest, you know, all these different things, clear speaking, sports, football, take your pick, kind of checks off a lot of these boxes. And, you know, there's always an identity game. Republicans and Democrat Democrats play the identity game. Trump decided I'm not picking a woman. Give me some men to select from uh, Kamala Harris decided. I think a white guy or a, a white presenting guy, Josh Shapiro, are kind of our best choice. I think that there would be uh, it would be a drag on the campaign uh, if we are too overtly the party of non white women. Uh, so there's always identity politics at play. The question is, are you using identity politics to silence people? Just thinking what is the right kind of makeup of the ticket uh, is not oppressive identity politics. And Tim Walls uh, probably is the right choice as far as that goes as well. So agree very strongly and beyond with this comment. Uh, we did a poll on our YouTube channel in which one hundred and eight thousand of you voted. This is a strategy poll and it was used to attack my audience in a way that I really don't like. So let me tell you what the poll is, what the results are and what I mean. The poll said Kamala Harris and Tim Walls should introduce an agenda that, that excites either the progressive wing of the Democratic Party or centrist Democrats and never Trump Republicans. And almost three fourths of my audience said the Harris Walls agenda should excite centrist Democrats and never Trump Republicans. This was wrongly interpreted to mean the David Pakman audience is very conservative. This is a strategy question. The election will come down to sometimes voters, independent voters, undecided voters in three to five critical swing states. The opinion of my audience was given that Harris walls on paper are likely the most progressive Democratic nominees in American history. And most progressives understand that it are there more votes to gain from finding a way to appeal to the centrist Democrats and to the never Trump Republicans who are just looking for any reason to say, hey, you know what? I'm not staying home. I'm not going to relent and vote Trump. I'm going to get out and vote for the Democratic ticket. So as far as the strategy question goes, I think that people are right. It was wrongly used to suggest that my audience is conservative. And, you know, time and time again, every time we do audience surveys, we find that the the audience is to my left and I'm to the left of Joe Biden. OK, from the subreddit, Scientist 78 said hearing David swear I like it. I always thought David was very careful when speaking, but I just realized it's because he is no longer on TV and radio. Hearing him read some quotes and drop the F bomb was awesome. You know, it's been a complete and total non event for me. If someone now that we're not on radio and TV, if I get a voicemail that con contains profanity, we just play it. It's no big deal. If there's an email I'm reading that contains profanity, I don't have to censor myself. It just feels a little more adult. It's sort of like curb your enthusiasm is sort of like Seinfeld. If we didn't have to cater to the FCC, if it was a more adult show. And I think that it's a little more serious not to have to bleeps. And, you know, I think I think we're, we're significantly better off. All right. Uh, no horse wrote on Reddit. Are we ever going to address the fact that David used to wear oversized tan suits with shirts that didn't match? And they've included a screenshot that is 11 years old. So he, here's what I want to say to you. If you don't want to watch this show because you don't like my shirt or my hair or my mustache or the size of my microphone or whatever, any reason to watch or not watch, you are the boss. But I do think it's important to clarify 
that the style 11 years ago was not for the slimmer fit suits and sports coats and jackets that there is today. So we have to it's I, I hate to make a crass analogy, but it's sort of like when we evaluate an elected official's position on a social issue when they were in office in 1850, it would be useful to consider the norms of the time and the norms of 11 years ago were for baggier uh, clothing. OK, so please uh, come on, guys. Come on. Info at David If you have something you'd like to say, we sometimes will select YouTube comments or uh, TikTok comments or whatever the case may be. We've got a great bonus show for you today. We're here all week next week. I have a very, very exciting announcement about my triumphant return to Washington, D.C. that is forthcoming that I think some of you will say, you know, David's finally getting the recognition he probably doesn't deserve, but is interesting to get anyway. And as a final reminder, we are now beyond fifteen hundred pre orders for my forthcoming book, The Echo Machine. Help us get to two thousand by pre ordering the book at davidpackmancom slash echo. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, bookshop dot org, audible, Apple podcast, Apple books, Apple ebooks, anywhere that physical books, ebooks and audio books are sold, you will find the book. Every pre order, regardless of format, pushes us one closer to 2000. I'll give you updated numbers next week. I'll see you on the bonus show. Have a great weekend, everybody.